The cosmological argument is one of the most popular arguments used to defend a belief in the assertion that God exists. For many people, when we ask the question, what caused the universe or the cosmos to come into existence, the follow-up to that scientific line of inquiry might be, why has the universe been caused in the first place? This question might be seen to go beyond the framework of the original scientific question of how to why. In order to fulfill the rubric of the CS specification, candidates need to be able to demonstrate their knowledge and understanding and be able to critically evaluate the following. The historical background, its rejection of infinite regress, the three forms of the argument in Aquinas, reformulations of the argument, the critique of the argument and its value for religious faith, the relevance of causality to the debate, the universe is a brute fact, and the atheist view. The cosmological argument is perhaps one of the most popular of the classical arguments for God's existence. It is an a posteriori argument, meaning that it relies on some experience of reality. In this case, the fact that the universe itself exists, and this can only be known through experience. At the heart of the appeal of the cosmological argument is its appeal to the existence of the universe. For as long as people have questioned how the universe came into existence, they have questioned why the universe came into existence at all. The cosmological argument, in its most basic form, asks the ultimate question. Why is there something rather than nothing? Perhaps it would be more accurate to refer to the cosmological arguments, as there have been many variations and adaptations of the arguments down through the years. In fact, some of the earliest versions of this argument can be traced back to Plato and Aristotle. Plato believed that motion and change were brought about by something external to the things they happen to. He believed that there is a self-moving principle from which all change and motion originate. This is the soul. It is the soul that is responsible for the world as it is. The Greek philosopher Aristotle argued that if there is movement and change, then there must be an unmoved mover. This unmoved mover was not a personal god, but it was the ultimate cause for the universe. St. Thomas Aquinas was heavily influenced by the ideas of Aristotle, and it is to his presentation of the cosmological argument that we now turn. St. Thomas Aquinas is one of the most famous philosophers that we will look at during our course. He was a monk during the Middle Ages, and he was both a theologian and a philosopher. He relied heavily on the scientific thinking of Aristotle, and this had a major influence on his work. Medieval age in which Aquinas lived sought to recapture the scientific and philosophical thinking of Aristotle to which Aquinas reconciled with the theology of his Christian faith. A natural theology, a reconciliation of faith and reason. Aquinas' first way is from motion and it goes like this. Everything in the world is moving or changing. Nothing moves or changes by itself. We can trace this chain of movement back for a very long period of time, but there must be a prime mover, a first mover that causes its own movement. This everyone knows as God. The layout of this argument is a form of logical reasoning, and the strength of the conclusion is directly determined by the strength of each of the premises. It is important therefore to take each one in turn and to evaluate the strengths and weaknesses of each part of the argument. Aquinas started off his argument with a fairly obvious observation that everything that he could see was either in motion or in a state of change. For things to be in motion, they don't have to be as dramatic as fireworks. But Aquinas was fairly confident in his assertion that everything was in motion or change. He defined motion as the reduction of something from a state of potentiality to a state of actuality and gave the example of a match, which is actually hot, reducing wood, which is potentially hot, to a state of being actually hot. Aquinas borrowed Aristotle's definition of motion and using the example of a statue sculpted from a stone, Aristotle demonstrated that an object was in one of two states, actual or potential. 
The marble stone has the potential to become a statue, but once it has been sculpted, it is no longer potentially a statue, but actually a statue. It cannot be in both states simultaneously at the same time, and therefore the object has been reduced from one state to the other. The obvious issue that arises out of this definition is that if nothing can simultaneously be both the potency and the act, where does the change originate from? This is where one of Aristotle's most famous ideas comes in, the idea of efficient cause. Aristotle explains the need for an efficient cause that brings about or affects change through the example of an acorn which has the potential to grow into an actual oak tree. Clearly it needs water to affect this change and Aristotle asks us whether that is potential water or actual water. Obviously potential water doesn't exist so it's actual water is required to affect the change of the acorn. Aquinas assumed he was on safe ground by suggesting that everything in the world that he could see was either moving or changing and that nothing could move or change by itself. In a moment we'll dig a little deeper to see whether modern scholars and modern scientists agree with him, but for now let's just assume that he was right and that everything in the world that is moving or changing cannot move or change itself. Aquinas believed that you could explain each motion or change by the event that immediately preceded it. He believed that you could trace this chain of events back for a very long period of time, but that ultimately this could not go on forever. This is known as his rejection of infinite regress. It is worth spending a little bit of time exploring this premise as some philosophers believe that Aquinas' rejection of infinite regress is one of the most vulnerable aspects of his argument. Aquinas believed that no matter how long the chain of motion or change, that even if you could explain each stage of the chain, eventually there's a need for the chain to start. Over time, different philosophers attempting to defend and explain Aquinas' rejection of infinite regress introduced a simple analogy of dominoes. The idea is that no matter how many dominoes are in the sequence, not one domino will move unless something which is not another domino affects the change or motion. This might be the finger pushing over the first domino and this is analogous to God. 